In today's lecture, we're talking about the order Actinomycetales, a diverse group of bacteria that includes not only pathogens, but organisms which produce antibiotics. This bacterial order includes diverse genera, which include some really important veterinary pathogens. Throughout the order, we have organisms which are classified as either biocontainment level one or two. These are gram-positive bacteria, and we'll briefly go through some of their basic microbiological features. Our actinomyces and nocardia species are microaerophilic or potentially anaerobic, non-spore-forming filamentous rods. And nocardia are really interesting in that they have a cell wall which is quite similar to mycobacterium, which, as we'll learn in a future lecture, is acid fast and requires special staining to visualize. Both the actinomyces and nocardia are often described as having branching hyphae. Um, this is a bit of a misnomer because true hyphae are actually fungal elements, and so these bacteria would more accurately be described as having branching filaments. Cuprella pyogenes, formerly known as Arcanobacterium pyogenes, are pleomorphic, gram-positive coccobacilli, so they're variable in their morphology. And then Dermatophilus congolensis is one of only two species within this genus, and it has a very characteristic appearance on cytology. Um, what you'll see uh, clinically are the presence of these uh, tram track arranged zoospores, so like this cartoon up in the right here, this looks really unlike anything else and is almost pathognomonic when seen microscopically. In pure culture, Dermatophilus congolensis is pleomorphic, as you can see on the lower right-hand image here, um, with both free-living zoospores um, and longer elements as well. Streptomyces species also fall within the Actinomycetales, these are soil organisms and over the decades have been a source of many useful natural products, including antibiotics, so chloramphenicol, lincomycin, streptomycin, neomycin, tetracycline, daptomycin, phosphomycin, and clavulanic acid, ivermectin, which is an antiparasitic agent, and even chemotherapeutic drugs like bleomycin. In this cytological preparation, you can see the branching filaments, which are characteristic of both nocardia and actinomyces, these long slender rods with branch points. Very, very classical. Here's another image here. You can see these long branching filaments uh, within the uh, infected tissues. Actinomyces and Truparella are host-associated organisms. We find them on the mucous membranes, in the nasal cavity, in the pharynx. Dermatophilus congolensis is also maintained by uh, carrier animals. It's also host-associated. While our nocardia and streptomyces are environmental organisms, these are bugs that we find in dirt. Their natural uh, environment is not uh, a vertebrate host. Streptomyces species are generally considered non-pathogenic, and so we aren't going to talk about them uh, very much in this lecture. There are, however, many, many species uh, of Streptomyces, so 711, we've got 128 Nocardia species, 33 Actinomyces, this is the genus Actinomyces within the order Actinomycetales, six species of Truparella, one of Dermatophilus, and one Actinobaculum. Um, perhaps the easiest way to separate them is just based on their morphology, so filamentous bacteria are going to be either Nocardia or Actinomyces, if they're not filamentous and they have that tram track appearance, we're likely talking about a Dermatophilus congolensis, or if we have pleomorphic small rods, uh, these are our Truparella pyogenes. Between our filamentous rods, we can separate them based on their ability to be stained using the acid fast stain. So our nocardias are acid fast positive, while actinomyces are acid fast negative. And then our actinomyces, our, our species of clinical interest, can be further subdivided based on the presence of granules. So these are these structures which develop uh, within infectious tissue, um, sulfur granules that we see with A. bovis, and white granules with A. viscosis. Virulence factors associated with actinomyces are really quite poorly defined. We don't have a good understanding of 
how these bacteria actually cause disease. Truparella pyogenes, we know a little bit more. It produces a pyolysin, which is a cytotoxin active against neutrophils. And in lab animals, it's also been shown to be dermonecrotic experimentally. Truparella pyogenes also produces neuraminidases, um, collagen binding proteins and fimbrae, which all help these organisms to adhere and associate with host tissues at the site of infection. Dermatophilus congolensis produces proteases, which are involved in breaking down tissues and invasion um, into deeper structures. Nocardia are facultative intracellular parasites. They're able to grow within poly polymorphonuclear neutrophils, and they're able to inhibit phagosome lysosome fusion within macrophages, so preventing our white blood cells from actually killing the organisms and performing their normal functions. In cattle, we see actinomyces as a cause of lumpy jaw. In dogs and cats, both actinomyces and nocardia are commonly seen associated with foreign body type infections. So a bit of plant material or something makes its way into the animal, either through a penetrating wound or perhaps a porcupine quill, grass on, things like that. And we get these migrating bits of uh, material that drag the actinomyces and nocardia into different parts of the body. We can see pyothorax or subcutaneous infections. In pigs, actinobaculum suis is a cause of urinary tract infections. And dermatophilus congolensis causes a variety of conditions, all sort of superficial cutaneous infections. In horses and cattle, we see rain scald. In sheep, we see uh, a disease colloquially known as lumpy wool, as well as strawberry foot rot. And then dermat dermatophilosis in dogs and cats, which is typically associated with abscessation and superficial wounds. Truparella pyogenes causes a wide variety of infections in primarily agricultural animals. And these tend to be infections where we see a lot of separation. So we see lots and lots of pus formation. Laryngeal and liver abscesses, foot rot, septic arthritis, and Truparella is frequently associated with Fusobacterium necrophilum. They tend to grow together. They're, they're good bacterial friends. First disease we're going to talk about is lumpy jaw caused by Actinomyces bovis. Um, this is something that's primarily seen in cattle, but other species of ruminants can also be affected. A bovis is a part of the normal uh, oral microbiota. And so we see disease, we see infections when we have some sort of damage to host tissues. So coarse feed, plant ons, little spiky bits that the cattle may be chewing on and causes trauma to the inside of the mouth. Mandibular lesions are most common. And what we see is a really pronounced formation of periosteal new bone in response to infection. So we get these large proliferative bony lesions. We see fibrosis, hard, immovable, painless masses, and we can get the development of draining tracts as well. So this is what it can actually look like. Here on the left, we have an image of a cow with an A. bovis infection. You can see both very proliferative lesions. There's a lot of new bone formation here and draining tracts um, to the uh, uh, outside of the animal. Here on the right, you can see a bovine mandible from an animal that had lumpy jaw. And I think you can appreciate just how proliferative and abnormal uh, these bony structures are over here. Here we can see some cytological preparations of purulent material coming out of one of those draining tracts. And I think what you can appreciate are these filamentous structures that are really characteristic of Actinomyces bovis. So a cytological, um, this cytological evidence is, is very strongly supportive of a diagnosis of A. bovis in a cow with such uh, a clinical presentation. While these lesions are typically not painful, they can become painful when they involve the teeth or tooth roots. This is manifested by a reluctance to eat. Um, treatment of these infections involves both debridement and antimicrobials. If you have draining tracts present, it would be uh, reasonable to talk to a surgeon and seek some advice about management with disinfectants. And then we can also treat with penicillin antimicrobials. It's really important to know that while treatment can arrest lesion growth and kill the organisms, you don't actually get regression of those lesions. 
So once we have that periosteal new bone, it's probably not going anywhere. Preventing the disease is really heavily reliant upon ensuring that we have access to high quality feed. So not having feed with lots of spiky, thorny, thistly material um, that's going to cause trauma to the inside of the cow's mouth. In dogs and cats, we see infections with a wide variety of actinomyces species. So cordial vulnaris, viscosis, and canis are amongst the most common, but certainly others are also encountered. This is, again, uh, sometimes part of the normal microbiota, but we also see it associated with uh, penetrating wounds from foreign bodies. So grass-ons, penetrating stick wounds, or other things which damage the oropharynx. I think you can imagine that dogs which have a very outdoor lifestyle, so hunting and sport breeds, may be at greatest risk of developing these infections as they're running through more wilderness environments. Oftentimes these uh, infections present as a pyothorax, but infections at other sites are certainly possible as well. So pulmonary lesions and, and pneumonia, if we have aspiration of grass or, or um, plant ons, and we can get abdominal infections as well as a foreign body migrates um, out of, for instance, the gastrointestinal tract. Plant material and grass ons might seem like a really innocuous thing for a dog or cat to encounter. So I've put a link to a video above that shows just how successful some of these structures can be at invading into deeper tissues. In dogs and cats with migrating plant ons, um, the presentation is quite variable. The head and cervical region are most commonly affected. Fluid within the abscesses is oftentimes serosanguinous to purulent. It contains sulfur granules, and you can also see the presence of filamentous rods microscopically. Because these infections are associated with migrating plant material, so things that have come in from the outside of the body, they're oftentimes polymicrobial. These plant materials don't enter the body um, as sterile objects, obviously, and so we see multiple organisms um, at the same time. Treatment relies on removing the foreign body after you find it, which can be quite, quite challenging, followed by long-term uh, antimicrobials, typically penicillin. Here you can see some filamentous rods um, from a cytological preparation from a horse. Um, and in this case, again, we have uh, what looks like a pink structure. Remember, cytology is not done using the gram stain. This is probably a hematoxylin and eosin preparation. And so although this is gram positive, it appears pink. Actinobaculum suis is a commensal of the urogenital tract of pigs and a cause of urinary tract infections. The clinical signs vary quite widely. Uh, typically, pigs are a febrile. Uh, you may see hematuria and pyuria, or in severe instances, you may actually just find dead pigs from acute renal failure. From bacterial cystitis, we can see ascending infections and progression to pyelonephritis. And this is actually a very important reason for pig kidneys to be rejected at slaughter um, and condemned. So we don't want to allow infected tissues into the food supply, and actinobaculum suis is responsible for many of these. Treatment of these infections uh, relies heavily on antimicrobials, so penicillins, and then also management practices, both ensuring a high hygiene barn facility and ensuring that the pigs have access to sufficient quantities of water so that the protective urine flushing of the lower urinary tract um, is facilitated. Other actinobaculum species are associated with UTIs in people. So when you hear the genus actinobaculum, think urinary tract. That's an association that should be made. <laughs>